Good morning and welcome to worship. Does anyone have any announcements this morning? Brianna turned 18 on Tuesday. There, I did it for you. There. You're welcome. She can only holler at me now instead of you. <laughs> Whoops, I got another one here hollering at me. The senior group will be heading to uh, Old Stonewall for lunch on Wednesday. Please join us. There's a, an item in the bulletin that gives the details. Thanks. Okay, once again, uh, for the shut-ins, I did cards. They're back on the back table. If each one could just take one, it's not if you have to take half a dozen, just take one, and please make sure you keep in touch with that person so they know that you're thinking about them. So there's cards with the, with the address and everything on them, and if you need birth dates or anything, uh, you can always get that at the office if you want to send them a birthday card or something. But please make sure that our shut-ins know that we are thinking of them. And if you do know of anybody that uh, isn't on the list and you need somebody, because we have Janice Craig who needs prayers, so I added her name onto there. So if you think of anybody else, there's cards back there. All you have to do is just add them on. So please make sure that that table should be empty by the time we leave here today. Thank you. Um, I obviously I have no voice so I apologize but tis the season for everybody to be getting sick like this if you didn't see our choir's a little bit small and that's due to illnesses but I'd like to thank um, Jimmy Camp for coming he loves to sing so he went to his church and then he came back here to help sing with the anthem so I thank you very much Jim for that if there's anybody out there who loves to sing just loves to sing. Please come and join us on Thursdays at 6.30. You've heard the anthems, and if you've enjoyed what you've heard, come and help sing and praise God for us. Thank you. I said Thursday. We'd like to celebrate the 30th anniversary of Carl and Linda. Please come forward. And while they're coming forward, let's sing happy birthday. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, God bless you. Happy birthday to you. And many more. Wonderful. Welcome. Faith, hope, and love. These three. The greatest of these is love. It's love that brought you together 30 years ago. It's love that continues to bring you together. Even passionately in the parking lot. <laughs> no story at 11. <laughs> Don't worry. Let us pray. Lord God, in the goodness you created us male and female, by the gift of marriage you found each human community in a joy that begins now and is brought to perfection in the life to come. Because of sin or age-old rebellion, the gladness of marriage can be overcast, the gift of the family can become a burden, but because God who established marriage continues still to bless it with his abundant and ever-present support, we can be sustained in our weariness and have our joy restored. In Jesus Christ, amen. Carl, repeat after me. Linda, I take you to be my wife. Linda, I take you to be my wife. 
I now renew my promise. Now I renew my promise. To be your loving partner. To be your loving partner. Faithful to you. Faithful to you. Till death parts us. To death. <laughs> Sounded ominous, didn't it? Mm. Carl, I have taken you to be my husband. Carl, I have taken you to be my husband. I now renew my promise. I now renew my promise. To be your loving partner. To be your loving partner. Faithful to you. Faithful to you. Until death parts us. Until death parts us. The Lord God who created our first parents and established them in marriage continue to sustain you that you may find new delight in each other and grow in holy love until your life's end. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. You may embrace with a kiss. Please stand for confession and forgiveness. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, the strength of our ancestors, the host of this meal, the builder of the city that is to come. If we have died with Christ, we will also live with Christ. Let us confess our sin to the one who is faithful. God, our helper, we confess the many ways we have failed to live as your disciples. We have not finished what we began. We have feasted with friends but ignored strangers. We have been captivated by our possessions. Lift our burdens, gracious God. Refresh our hearts and forgive our sin. Raise us to the new life you have chosen for us in Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. There is rejoicing in heaven when sinners repent. Put your trust in these promises. God will never leave you or forsake you. You who were lost have been found. For the sake of Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. Rejoice with the angels at this good news. Amen. Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all.
Let us pray. Benevolent, merciful God, when we are empty, fill us. When we are weak in faith, strengthen us. When we are cold in love, warm us. With that fervor, we may love our neighbors and serve them for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Please be seated. Are there any children to come forward and help me with a message? How we doing? If church people were in the Olympics and we would win a gold medal, it would probably be in worrying. Church people worry better than any people I know. There's always something that's not right, or we forgot this, or we didn't do that, or is that okay? Also, a part of worrying is to be provoked. And church people are really good, right? If you want to get somebody's goat, you want to get somebody upset, we know just how to do it. So we all get a gold medal for our worry. See, I have one on. So congratulations for winning the gold. What do you worry about? When, when I, I, I can't find my home. When I can't, when I can't find my parents. When you can't find your parents, you worry. Do you, do you think they hide from you sometimes? No. <laughs> no. I bet you they do. They, I bet you sometimes they hide from you. Like when you yeah, watch them. Look, we'll, we're going to watch them. Yeah. What else do you worry about? What do you worry about? Get lost in the forest. Get lost in the forest? <laughs> that would be worrying. What do you worry about? A giant spider. Giant spider. <laughs> Guess what's above your head? <laughs> ah! <laughs> Coming down and landing on you. Huh? Worry. What do you worry about? What do you think? Can you share anything? Or are you worried that we might laugh? <laughs> I'm worried to share with you what I'm worried about because you might make fun of me. Hmm? Anything else? Now who out here is a good worrier? Let's look out here. Who, who is the best worrier in the choir? Huh? Come on, give the award. Give the award. There we go. The best warrior in the choir. Nice. Nice. Nautis is the best warrior. Yes. How about out here with the 30th anniversary gang? Who's the best warrior among you? My friend Patty on the Oh, Patty, Nautis. Give her give her the award. Give her award. She gets the award. There you go. Wear it with pride. It does separate. I, I was worried that the kids would choke or get, you know, get choked. So somebody showed me that these separate. So I don't need to worry anymore. All right. How about in this section over here? Dad, are you worried about how the acolytes are doing? Oh, a little bit. Give dad one. Give dad one. Right there in the blue shirt. There you go. All right. Now, we already gave Brianna one. She was worried about her birthday being announced. <laughs> and she was right to be worried because we were announcing it one way or another. Who else? How about you back here in the third and fourth rows? Miss K. Miss K. She already denounced that she does not worry. She trusts God and puts all her trust in God. Here, give her two. 
<laughs> Who else is worrying? Huh? Not my dad. Not your dad? He doesn't worry? He's probably worried that you're going to find him. <laughs> I already know where he is. You know where he is? Even when he's hiding from you? <laughs> We'll put them right here, and as you're called, you want a medal. You're welcome to a medal. Dear God, replace our worry with faith to trust you. Amen. Thank you. Have a good day. lesson for today is taken from the first and second chapters of Habakkuk, verses 1 through 4 in each chapter. O Lord, how long shall I cry for help, and you will not listen? Or cry to you violence, and you will not save? Why do you make me see wrongdoing and look at trouble? Destruction and violence are before me. Strife and contention arise. So the law becomes slack, and justice never prevails. The wicked surround the righteous. Therefore judgment comes forth perverted. I will stand at my watch post and station myself on the rampart. I will keep watch to see what he will say to me, and what he will answer concerning my complaint. Then the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision. Make it plain on tablets so that a runner may read it. For there is still a vision for the appointed time. It speaks of the end and does not lie. If it seems to tarry, wait for it. It will surely come. It will not delay. Look at the proud. Their spirit is not right in them, but the righteous live by their faith. The word of the Lord. Uh, we will now read in unison Psalm 37, verses 1 through 9. Do not be provoked by evildoers. Do not be jealous of those who do wrong. For they shall soon wither like the grass, and like the green grass fade away. Put your trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and find safe pasture. Take delight in the Lord. You shall give your heart's desire. Commit your way to the Lord. Put your trust in the Lord and see what God will do. The Lord will make your vindication as clear as the light. It's this of your case like the noonday sun. Patiently. Do not be provoked by the one who prospers, the one who succeeds in evil schemes. Refrain from anger, leave rage alone. Do not be provoked, it leads only to evil. For evildoers shall be cut off, but those who hope in the Lord shall possess the land. Our second lesson for today is taken from the first chapter of 2 Timothy, verses 1 through 14. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, for the sake of the promise of life that is in Christ Jesus. To Timothy, my beloved child, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. I am grateful to God whom I worship with a clear conscience as my ancestors did. When I remember you constantly in my prayers night and day, recalling your tears, I long to see you so that I may be filled with joy. I am reminded of your sincere faith, a faith that lived first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and now I am sure lives in you. For this reason, I remind you to rekindle the gift of God that is within you through the laying on of my hands. For God did not give us a spirit of cowardice, but rather a spirit of power and of love and of self-discipline. 
Do not be ashamed then of the testimony about our Lord or of me, his prisoner, but join with me in suffering for the gospel, relying on the power of God who saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace. This grace was given to us in Christ Jesus before the ages began, but it has now been revealed through the appearing of our Savior Christ Jesus, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. For this gospel I was appointed a herald and an apostle and a teacher, and for this reason I suffer as I do. But I am not ashamed, for I know the one in whom I have put my trust, and I am sure that he is able to guard until that day what I have entrusted to him. Hold to the standard of sound teaching that you have heard from me in the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. Guard the good treasure entrusted to you with the help of the Holy Spirit living in us. The word of the Lord. We stand for the Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the 17th chapter. Glory to O Lord. The apostles said to the Lord, increase our faith. The Lord Jesus replied, if you had faith the size of a mustard seed, you could see, you could say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and planted in the sea and it would obey. Who among you would say to your slave, who has just come in from plowing or tending sheep in the field, come here at once and take your place at the table? Would you not rather say to him, prepare supper, supper for me, put on your apron and serve me while I eat and drink? Later you may eat and drink. Do you think... Do you thank the slave for doing what was commanded? So you also, when you have done all that you were ordered to do, say, we are worthless slaves. We have done only what we ought to have done. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Please be seated. Habakkuk is... A prophet of God, his name means embraced, embraced by God, and also one who embraces God. But in the midst of this struggle of life, he yells out, violence! Be the equivalent of, maybe you're trying to get somebody's attention, you say, help! Or, fire! And everybody stops what they're doing, it's what? Where? How can I help? Habakkuk is incensed. He's irate at what's happening in his life and around and what he sees. And he's troubled by it. And he's in this turmoil with God. But notice, in the midst of all the turmoil... He doesn't deny that it exists. He doesn't act like it, it's not there. He sees it. He knows it. He knows the turmoil. In the midst of it, he knows that God is the only one who has a solution. God is the only one who can embrace him and embrace the turmoil in such a way as to make it better. God is the only one. And he never loses that. 
So if you turn to Psalm 37 in your bulletins, there's going to be a quiz. Would that cause you to worry? If we're going to give you a quiz in front of everybody on your knowledge of Psalm 37... Would it provoke you? Would it make you angry? Would it cause you to fret? Or worry? Now, if you look at verse 1 and verse 7 and verse 8, you see the word provoked. If you turn to your NRSV translation of Psalm 37, in the place of that word provoked, you would see the word in verse 1, in verse 7, verse 8, the word fret. And that changes it entirely for me. But it adds a nuance to it. The nuance that this word encompasses. Because in a sense, we are easily provoked. And the provoking, the provocation can cause Anger it can cause heat, cause us to glow, if you will. Right? And that's a part of this fretting activity that being provoked by somebody doing something, by somebody profiting when they shouldn't have, by something happening that's not right and you're struggling with it, you're in turmoil. Also, part of this word is to fret or to worry. And in that part of it, it, it seems more of an internal combustion. Right? As people have said, yeah, I've, I've worried so much that I made myself sick. And I worry so much that it's just like the acids eat your stomach and cause, you, cause an ulcer. Your health your blood pressure is affected. There's all kinds of ways that provocation, that fretting, kills us, hurts us, and causes more problems and more struggles. So with Habakkuk, with our psalmist, this is a psalm of David, we say, Lord, you're the solution. You're the only one who can handle this Provocation. You're the only one who can handle this worry and this fret. Give me the strength to give it to you. Again and again and again. Because we carry these medals around every day. And we're good at earning these awards. And that's not going to change tomorrow. We're still going to worry. We're still going to be provoked. So at least for here, for right now, we're naming it. We're saying, Lord, I need help. And you're the only solution. You're the only one I can, that can help me. Now turn to 2 Timothy and the two ladies that are mentioned in that reading that we have. Grandmom and mom. Now, Timothy is not Paul's son, but he's like a son. And perhaps there's relationships here. Maybe you're not mother, daughter, son, father, but you're like a relation. And you would say, yes, you are, brother. Yes, you are, sister. That's what's going on with Timothy in the early church and Paul. Right? They're family. In the midst of all the struggles and things that are not right, instead of fretting or being provoked by them, they establish family bonds in the first generation of Christians and in generations today. It happens. How does it happen? Well, it happens because of what Eunice and Lois have passed on. 
because of what our ancestors have given us through the laying on of hands and the trust. They've given us faith. Hmm? Lois and Eunice gave Timothy faith. Timothy has this faith in Jesus Christ. God is the solution in the midst of all of what is not right. Whether it provokes or it causes worry. God is the solution. That's what our ancestors have given us. Hmm? What would you name as a gift from an ancestor that has been given to you, say, for today? What is a treasure that you have? Love? Love? See how beautiful that is to keep alive and to cherish and to share? It's beautiful. It makes life worth living. That's the kind of treasure that our ancestors have given us. What else? Is there another one? A work ethic. A good one, I imagine. A hard one. Hard work ethic. You persevere, you, you get it done. You have your goals, high standards. Helps make worth life worth living. Any others? Joy. Joy. Your ancestors gifted to you the importance, the worth of joy. Can you imagine the next generation in your family without that gift? And what that would do to them? Right? Whether it's a work ethic, love, joy. Ours is to pass down the treasures that God has entrusted to us through our loved ones, to the loved ones who come after us. And that's a beautiful process to be in. So we're with our disciples who are with Jesus. And Jesus is talking about forgiveness in the verses uh, leading up to the 17th chapter of Luke. And so they're all remembering how Many times they have to forgive. And they're probably thinking, like we are, it's not in me to forgive that person again. I'm in such turmoil. I'm in su I've been provoked so many times. I'm so worried that they're not going to change. What is my forgiving them again do? So they asked Jesus, how many... Give us increase." Our faith. How much faith do we need? We need more, Jesus. Will you increase our faith? And Jesus changes it. It's not how much faith you have. It's a gift of faith. And the power that comes with it. The presence of God that comes with it. Not in how much you have. If you have the gift of faith from God... You have an awesome power. You have the power to become meek. Now if you look around at the world, even in the school, one of our confirmands says the definition for meek on his vocabulary test this week was weak. To be meek is weak. Unsure yourself. To be meek is a bad thing. If you looked at Psalm 37, by the 11th verse, it talks about weakness. It talks about meekness. Jesus was meek. Was he weak? To be meek is to be in control. 
in the midst of being provoked, you're in control still. And instead of giving in to the worry, to the fretting, to the provocation, you're still self-disciplined as Eunice and Lois gave faith to Timothy. And Paul recognizes it and says, of one of the three, be in self-control. That's meekness. And there's so many wonderful, beautiful things about this gift of faith that God has embraced us with, has given to us, and we, in turn, embrace each other with the same gifts to build up and to help. Doesn't need to be increased, your faith. You have enough. Right where you're at. Just as you are. Share it. The second part of the gospel text sounds like racism to me. And when you mention racism to a bunch of white people, you get different responses. A lot of times you get anger because people say, I'm not a racist, and they deny it. Other individuals will say, well, it's not me. I've never acted that way. But all of us have been in a situation where we thought we were better than someone else. And it may or may not have to do with ethnicity. Maybe it was position. Your servant, your waiter, your waitress. Maybe it's a family member. And you've elevated yourself above them. Imagine the provocation and a lack of meekness because you didn't want to be weak or used as a doormat. The meekness of Christ is not weakness. You know who you are. In the midst of the struggles, in the midst of the need to be forgiven and to forgive, in the midst of things that are struggling and troubling, that are not resolving, you're embraced by God and you're embracing God as the solution. And so in, mid, in the midst of a great struggle, say in racism, Christ delivers the answer with giving us faith. How beautiful is that? And then to pass that down with love, with joy, with a work ethic. Gifts from God. We thank you, Lord, for replacing our fretting and our provocation with faith. Amen.